called this meeting because I think it's high time we brushed up on what we know about automotive electricity. Every year, our cars add more electrical units just to make driving easier for the owners. Yeah, Grant. And every year, more technicians turn purple when they have to do an electrical job. Right, Tech. And actually, electrical repair is as easy as simple plumbing, except that, well, you can see water while electricity is invisible. Let's look at it this way. In your home, only three things keep water from reaching its destination. Lack of pressure, a plugged pipe, or a leaky pipe. Now, in a car's electrical system, the battery and generator supply electrical pressure. We call it voltage. The wires correspond to the pipe, since they carry the current flow, which we call amperage. Lack of pressure, of course, would mean a low battery. A plugged pipe would correspond to a broken or disconnected wire. Water or current couldn't get through. You could also have a partially plugged pipe. The electrical counterpart would be a loose or dirty connection which would reduce the flow of current. Now to correspond to a water leak, there's a short or an accidental ground. Well, actually, shorts aren't too hard to locate. Uh, the wire heats up. Insulation starts to burn on the shorted wire or unit. But before there's any serious damage, a fuse or circuit breaker disconnects the shorted out section from the source of supply to protect the system. Yeah, and that's where we have to start checking out the circuit, huh? Right, Ernie. And for checking some ignition and generator conditions, test instruments are tops. But for most of the common electrical jobs, like finding open or high resistance circuits, a jumper wire comes in handy. Oh, you mean uh, using a jumper to bypass parts of the circuit so you can close in on the section at fault. That's right, Fred. Just like a pipe bypass in a water system. Be sure to use a good set of jumpers with insulated clips to avoid accidental shorts, especially on 12-volt systems. Never use a screwdriver. You'll not only ruin the tool, but you can damage the system as well. Okay, Tech. And another thing, learn to use wiring diagrams. They tell what units are in the circuit and how they're hooked up. Now, in order to check a circuit, you should know what each unit does and how it does it. Let's talk about control units, for example. A manually operated switch is the simplest way to control electrical flow. It's like using a valve to stop and start the flow of water. But you can't use manually operated switches all over. There'd be too many levers to flip. You'd have to know which ones to push and when. So instead, we use relays, circuit breakers, and solenoids. You mean relays, circuit breakers, and solenoids work a lot like switches? Uh, basically, yes. And while each operates differently, it mainly starts and stops electrical flow. The headlamp switch, Ernie, is a good example of a manually operated switch. On a wiring diagram, You'll notice ground symbols at headlamps and at other external lamps. Now, when the lamp is grounded, a simple switch in the hot wire leading to the lamp turns it on or off. I got gotcha. you. Fine. Now, the foot dimmer switch channels current to the high or low beam filament. It's like a valve that sends water to the shower head instead of the tap into the bathtub. The dome light, map light, and handbrake indicator lights are not permanently grounded. They use a simple switch connected into the ground side of the circuit. Now, when this switch closes, it completes the circuit to ground. That type of circuit is used so the dome light will light automatically when the car door opens. It's like a refrigerator light. This circuit is often used for control from more than one location. How it works is clear, but what's the advantage? Well, instead of grounding the light and running a hot wire to each controlling switch, one hot wire runs to the dome light. And a ground wire at each controlling switch grounds the circuit to the body whenever a door opens. Uh-huh. I see it now. Good. Now, a circuit breaker is an automatic overload switch. It opens the circuit whenever current flow becomes too great. That protects the system from damage. Circuit breakers have a contact on a bimetallic strip. 
If current exceeds the breaker's rated capacity, the strip gets hot and bends. This opens the contact points, which opens the circuit. Now, when the bimetallic strip cools off, it straightens out. The points close, which closes the circuit. It's something like a fuse, but it doesn't blow, right? It offers the same protection, Fred. Fuses are also used in the radio circuit, for instance. There's one place you want the circuit to stay open until an internal short is located and fixed. Now let's look at the relay, like the one used in the horn circuit. The relay helps reduce the load on the controlling switch and circuit because the relay points carry the heavy load the horn needs. When a relay carries the heavy load, a small switch can be used in the control circuit without the danger of burning the switch points. Also, smaller wire can be used in the horn control circuit. And another thing, using a horn relay lets you connect the control circuit through the ignition switch. Then the horn won't blow when the ignition is turned off. Uh, how's that relay made, Grant? Well, Ernie, it's got a coil, a spring-loaded armature, and a set of contact points. One point is on the armature. The other is on a stationary bridge. A current from the ignition switch goes to the coil. The other end of the coil connects to the horn switch, which acts as a ground switch. Pushing the horn ring completes the circuit through the coil. Now the coil, in turn, produces a strong magnetic field which pulls the armature, closing the contact points. That completes the circuit from battery to the horn. I follow that, all right. Okay. Good. Now, if the horn won't blow and there's a relay in the circuit, use a jumper to check whether trouble's in the control switch, relay, or the horn. The wiring diagram will tell you which wires are hot. If a ground, like the horn switch, controls the relay, connect the jumper from the relay ground terminal to a good ground. If the horn blows, the relay's okay. The trouble's in the horn switch or the wires leading to it. If the horn doesn't work, the trouble might be in the hot circuit to the relay coil. Leave the ground jumper connected, but connect a second jumper from the ignition terminal of the relay to the battery. If the horn works, the trouble is in the hot wire circuit to the relay. But if the horn still won't work, it's either the horn or the relay. Then remove both jumpers. Connect one jumper lead to one of the heavy wire terminals and flash the other lead against the other heavy wire terminal. If the relay's at fault, the horns should work because you've bypassed the relay and completed the horn circuit directly. Now, there's still a chance that the horn ground might be at fault. So be sure to check that if everything else seems to be all right. I get the idea. Say, here's another idea. Somebody please turn the record over so we can try some other circuit checks. On some models, the simplest starting circuit uses only two control units, a starter switch and a starter solenoid. The most elaborate circuit uses three control switches, one relay, and one solenoid. On Plymouth, Dodge, and DeSoto fire sweep models, the starter solenoid acts like a heavy-duty relay. It's a magnetically operated switch. But because the starter sometimes draws more than 100 amperes, solenoid construction differs from that of a relay. The solenoid has a coil, a plunger, and a set of heavy-duty contacts. Turning the ignition switch to start completes the solenoid coil circuit. The coil becomes a powerful electromagnet. Immediately, the plunger is pulled toward the center of the magnetic field set up by the coil. A contact plate on the end of the plunger bridges the contacts and completes the circuit from the battery terminal to the starter terminal of the solenoid. I understand. How do you go about testing the solenoid? Well, Ernie, remember that all models except Dodge, Chrysler, and Imperial with torque flight use ignition key starting. On key starting circuits, then, 
Be sure the transmission's in neutral. Connect the jumper from the ground terminal of the solenoid to a good ground and turn the key to start the engine. If the starter works, the trouble's in the ground circuit. Now on cars with power flight or torque flight, the trouble may be at the neutral safety switch on the transmission. Suppose the engine doesn't start. Well, in that case, remove the jumper. Connect it to the ignition terminal of the solenoid. Touch the other end to the positive battery terminal. Now, if the engine now starts, the trouble's in the starter switch circuit. If it doesn't start, the solenoid's at fault. Yeah, fellas. And if you narrow trouble down to the starter switch, just check the switch and wires to and from it. Right, Tech, that's a good point. Now, keep in mind that Dodge, Chrysler, and Imperial Torque Flight cars use neutral push-button starting. This adds two more units to the starting circuit. Oh, you mean the neutral button starter switch and the vacuum lockout switch, right? Yeah, Fred. That neutral button starter switch is a simple switch. Over-travel of the neutral push button flips it mechanically. And since you don't want the starter engaged when the engine's already running, the vacuum lockout switch is added. It's mounted in the intake manifold and connected directly with the starter switch. Its contacts are held closed until the engine starts, and engine vacuum opens them. If you suspect the lockout switch, connect a jumper across its terminals to take it out of the circuit by bypassing it. Then, if the starter operates when the neutral button is pushed, the trouble is in the lockout switch. But, if the starter is still dead, and the starter solenoid and starter relay are okay, the trouble is in the neutral push-button starter switch. Right, Tech. Now, here's something else. Chrysler, Imperial, and all DeSotos, except the fire sweep, use a starter solenoid mounted on the starting motor. This solenoid does two jobs. When a solenoid coil is energized, the plunger pulls on a linkage that shifts the starter drive into engagement with the flywheel. The final bit of plunger travel completes a contact between the two main terminal studs, closing the circuit to the starting motor. The motor then cranks the engine. On these models, a relay is used in the circuit leading to the solenoid. And to find out whether trouble is in the solenoid or the relay, connect the jumper between the solenoid terminal of the starter relay and the battery positive terminal. This bypasses the relay. Now, if the solenoid operates, the relay was faulty. If it doesn't operate, the solenoid's at fault. Very clear. Now, what else should we dig into? Well, frankly, I think we'd better explain the ignition coil ballast resistor. It's a good idea. Everybody knows we don't need high primary current when the engine idles. But we sure do need the full blast when the engine's going at high speed. Without the ballast resistor, there'd be excessive burning of the distributor points during slow driving. The resistor guards against that. Just how does it do it, Grant? Well, at low engine speeds, points are closed longer. Current flows through the resistor long enough to heat it up. The heat, in turn, increases the resistor's resistance. That reduces current to the points, and the points don't burn. At higher engine speeds, points are closed a shorter time. Current doesn't have time to heat up the resistor, so it stays cooler and its resistance is reduced. Therefore, you maintain the current you need for high-speed operation. Now, if that resistor fails, it breaks the primary circuit to the coil. You can check for this by connecting a jumper across the two resistor terminals to bypass the resistor. If the engine starts, then you know the resistor has to be replaced. But won't bypassing the resistor damage the ignition system? No, Ernie. You'll get more arcing at the points, but no serious damage to the points unless you run a long time without the resistor. Okay, I think I'll remember that. Fine. Now, in case you've ever wondered, 
Reversing the coil primary leads does affect the strength of the spark at the plugs. So always connect the coil primary wires according to the plus and minus marks. Reversing the wires may cause ignition trouble. We'll watch that, Grant. Anything else on the coil? Well, we're using oil-insulated coils now. If some of that insulating oil leaks out, high-tension voltage can jump to the coil case and cause ignition trouble. Yeah, and that isn't always easy to find. If only a little oil is lost, the engine might not start when cold. But with ignition on and distributor points closed, the oil can get hot and expand. That fills up the airspace, corrects the internal short, and the engine then starts. Right, Tech. So, fellows, in a case of intermittent ignition failure, check for leakage at the tower terminal. If you find oil there, test the coil while it's cold and tighten the screw inside the tower. All right. Will do. Good. Now let's look at the reversible electric motors that operate power seats, power windows, and convertible tops. This type of motor has two sets of field windings. When one field is energized, the motor runs clockwise. When the other field is energized, the motor runs counterclockwise. A two-way switch controls the direction of rotation. On two-way power seats, the switch and circuit use three wires. One wire supplies current to the switch. One sends current to field windings, which move the seat forward. One wire goes to the other field windings, which move the seat rearward. The switch and current for the six-way power seat is quite a story in itself. You'll find that and other important details on the power window circuit covered in this reference book. Hey, I sure can use that book, Tech. Thanks. Glad you got a copy for me, too, Tech. I'll be sure to look it over. You do that. Our owners expect us to be up on electrical work, especially. So, when we are, it means more service business we can count on. <laughs>